Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to Wild China on Air. This is our unbelievable, this is our 49th event, virtual event in 2020. My name is Zhang Mei, and I'm the founder of Wild China. As I always say, when we can't travel, Wild China brings China to you, to your living room. Now with vaccine coming, I absolutely hope next summer you will be joining us in China uh, in summer 2021. Now today, we're very lucky to have two guests, very important voices in China's conservation with us. One is Kyle Oberman and the other one's Mr. Conway. Now Kyle, who's very young, you're gonna see in a second, but is a longtime friend of Wild China. And several years ago, while studying at Beidou, this is Beijing University, China's uh, premier uh, university, he interned at Wild China. At, but most interestingly, he took literally the path less traveled and uh, went on to explore China's conservation scene, photographing many, many of China's remote corners and national parks. And his work has been published across numerous renowned publications, including National Geographic uh, and a few others, revealing the human story of China's conservation, um, like the park rangers. He told many of such touching stories uh, against the backdrop of China's mega cities and infrastructure development projects. In 2017, Kyle was awarded Wild China's Explorer Grant to travel into the most beautiful yet very little known Hengduan mountain range and documented the rangers' lives there. Now, Kyle is a conservation star on popular Chinese TV show. So we are honored to have him here to share his stories. Our second guest is Conway, Director of Land Conservation Strategy at the Nature Conservancy in China. Now he has over 20 years experience uh, promoting sustainable development and nature conservation. One thing that really struck me while talking to Conway before this, uh, uh, today's event was he grew up in Ningxia very few of us know very few people from Ningxia. That's a desert region. It's a different kind of a conservation challenge over there, right? I'd love to hear your story today. And for those of us who, for those of you who joined us on the Wine uh, Taste of China event, that's where he's from, uh, Ningxia area. And um, now Conway worked on the first land trust conservation for giant pandas in Sichuan. It's a 27,000 acre park. And he also worked on the conservation of Yunnan snub-nosed monkeys uh, and also migratory birds, the conservation of high plateau wetlands in Yunnan mostly, right? But also other areas around China. He also worked on several, several national park projects including the giant panda park, Hainan's rainforest national park. So, Anyway, we're indeed thrilled to have you with us as well. A little bit, a few words on logistics. Uh, Kyle will take about 15 minutes to tell us his story and his views, what he sees in Chinese national parks. And Conway will uh, follow on with about 10 minute presentation on his, his work. Then I'll join them for a chat about 20 minutes. Any uh, questions, please feel free to put them in chat room uh, or on Q&A section. We'll try to get to them in the last portion of today's conversation. So anyway, without further delay, Kyle, why don't we start with you? I'll hand over you the room. Awesome. Well, well thank you so much. I mean, it is my honor to, uh, to, to be here and uh, with such with you two of such experience. So for the last yeah four years, I have been a concentration Hard from China and documenting these uh, lives of the rangers and the nature reserves. So it's uh, it's my privilege to be here and, and, and share their, their, some of their stories with you through photography. So um, I'll just jump right into it. So the first thing I do want to touch on is, is why I do my work and what is the problem that we see in Chinese conservation. So uh, I think in my experience in China, people do not understand the diversity and, and just the biodiversity of Chinese landscape. And, and people protect what they love, right? So th this first picture, if I asked people to guess where it is, I'm sure a lot of people, especially in the US would say Antelope Canyon, right? A very popular hiking destination. And indeed, you'd be right. And then if I showed you the second picture, I'm sure they would also say you know, Antelope Canyon, but actually this is a canyon in, in, in Shanxi, just a couple hours drive from Xi'an. 
And, and these, these photos and similarities are very surprising. I think being born in the US, I tend to think that you know, the US is so diverse. We have the Western US and we have Alaska, but actually China is even more biodiverse than the United States. And yet you see a lot of people, um, including myself, when I was a student, when I was in the US, kind of only thinking that China was, was large cities and smog. But again, people protect what they love. And so if people do not see China's wilderness for what it is, and they do not love China's wilderness for what it is, then we have a problem and a gap of what we're trying to achieve with conservation. So again, I, I like to see what, what kind of things people are thinking about China, right? So if I, you get on Google today, and you type in China environment and the top images, there you go, right? And I think it's, it's unsurprising. So, you know, the environment, you know, there can always be a negative connotation with this word. And, and you, know, you have all this smog and, and a you know, red river. And, you know, it, it looks like you're just going to drop dead when you live there. So that's what people are associating with the words China environment. And is this true? Is this actually representative of what is there and what is worth protecting? OK, but you can also do China landscape. I think this is probably a less biased way to search. So Google Images first page. All right, finally, some green, right? So much, much better, but there's actually a problem. Every one of these images, except for one image, is all Eastern China. And Eastern China, as we know, is the most populous area of China and also the least biodiverse. So when people think about China's landscape, they're actually not even thinking about half of China. It's like if you Googled US landscape and you didn't have any pictures of Colorado or Utah or California and you only had pictures of Georgia and New York, right? It would not be representative. And so it's, it's quite a fascinating juxtaposition. So every one of those photos are east of this black line, which, which can divide China as far as uh, economics and education and population and, and poverty. So east of the black line is all the big cities in China and to the west. Is the, is the wilderness. So this map, if anyone has any guesses, um, you, know, you can kind of think to yourself, but it's actually showing the mammal, the, the number of mammal species and, and the concentration of mammal species in China. And why mammal species? So large mammal species, the more mammal species they are, since they tend to require larger tracts of intact habitat, uh, they can also be used for a proxy uh, for biodiversity and, and, and the quality of the intact tracts of land. And so we see here that in the west of China is where all of the mammal diversity and biodiversity of China, most of it is, especially in this heart of China called the Hongguan Mountains, which is where I started working with the Wild China Grant. And this is still where today most of my work is focusing on. So again, in this red area, we have a high diversity of mammal species and biodiversity. And though, what has China done to protect this biodiversity? They've actually done quite a lot, starting in 1956. Uh, they've really actually had an explosion of, of building nature reserves. So this graph is a very quick graph. So 1956, it shows the first nature reserve. Uh, the green, the light green is the total area, so land mass of protected um, nature reserves. And the blue line is just the accumulated number of nature reserves. And so actually, uh, up until the early 1990s, there was a slow growth of nature reserves in China. But actually, around when I was born, actually, it seemed I was born in the right era, um, there was this explosion, this really big uptick around 1992 and 1994 of nature reserves in China. And so now they have almost 3,000 nature reserves and also almost 18,000 um, other types of protected areas in China. So there has been an explosion of nature reserves. Um, but of course, this very fast development, while it has been has good intentions, um, it has also you know, caused some, some lack of an, an oversight. So uh, this is an interesting graph. This, this basically is telling you uh, the yellow is, is the wilderness area of China. And so again, unsurprisingly, Western China, all wilderness, right? And, and the gray China is where you have the population. And then uh, the protected areas are in blue and red. And so you can see that so while China today has 17, over 17% 17 of its land mass is actually a protected area, uh, most of that is actually in Western China. And also I will say though in areas that, I'm, I'm not gonna say don't need it as much, but aren't maybe as much of an immediate threat, right? So mostly in the, in the Tibetan Plateau where there are a lot less people. Uh, and yes, there are, there are problems with poaching, 
but the 17% of China's land mass that's protected is in places that are already very, very far removed from people. And so in Eastern China, actually, you don't have as much protected land. Uh, but these also protected areas are forming the basis and the foundation of what is now becoming China's national parks. Uh, this graph, uh, so it's in Chinese, but this is just touching on why the national parks have come to being. Uh, very shortly, the national parks in China will not be like what we see in the United States. And they're not for the same reasons. Uh, perhaps they will be, but right now the national parks are more of an administrative upgrading of, of the complexities that came about from such a complex system of you know, 3,000 nature reserves built so quickly. So each dot here represents a protected area of China. And each one of these colors represents a different type of protected area that it is. And so as different types, they're managed by different departments and they're even, for example, um, for example, uh, Zhou Zaigo in Sichuan, a, a very, a very popular tourist destination place. It is, I think, three to four different types of protected areas in one place, and they're all overlapping. And so the management is overlapping, and it's been causing a ton of just uh, management deficiency and and kind of overlapping um, jurisdiction in a lot of these areas. And so now that China is having a national park system, it's actually uh, taking some of the most important of these ecosystems and putting them under control of the new newly parted um, National Park Administration. So today here we have, we have 10 pilot parks that have been announced uh, due to be complete by the end of this year. And this map is showing the link between these parks and the pre-existing uh, overlapping of protected areas. Um, so you have everything from the Sanjiang Yan in, in, the, uh, in the Qinghai of Tibet Plateau to the Hainan Tropical Rainforest National Park, uh, to the giant Panda National Park, which, which spans uh, three provinces. And Sanjiang Yan, by the way, is three times the size of Yellowstone National Park. So these are massive, massive areas. Um, and it's been very, very exciting developments. And I think we will see more than 10 national parks. So you, these were the first announced in 2015, uh, but also more are underway and under discussion. So I've seen some maps that says China wants to have 50 national parks, uh, but the entire system isn't due to co be complete until 2035. Um, so lots of different animals in the national parks. This is a video of, uh, of a takin, one of my favorite uh, species. It's quite a funny looking species. Looks like it has a massive nose as it waddles across, but that's also a, a class one protected species in China, often found in the, uh, in the panda habitat actually as well. And of course you have snow leopards, right? Everyone knows that uh, in the Tibetan Plateau there are snow leopards. What they don't know, and what I found fascinating, which I only found out recently, is that they share the exact same habitat as pandas sometimes. This is taken in Wolong Nature Reserve by an infrared camera, so not by me, but by the Nature Reserve. You can see here it's the exact same rock. It's the, literally the exact same location uh, where the panda and the snow leopard, their habitat are colliding, right? So the, the incredibly biodiverse. This is only, you know, maybe a three hours drive from Chengdu where I live. Uh, amazing, amazing habitat, and the richness of species here is absolutely incredible. And then you have the favorite prey of the snow leopard, uh, which is not rock, uh, as it looks like in the picture. It's actually blue sheep. Uh, I think there are 11 in this photo. Uh, I usually have people guess, but for time's sake, I'm just going to reveal their locations to you. Uh, if you found one, I, uh, good, good for you. But uh, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11. Okay. I don't know if anyone saw any, but there they are, zoomed in. So the blue sheep. Um, if you're a snow leopard, this is, this is your meal. And actually, snow leopards, I like to think of them also as kind of rock leopards because they have the color of their coat actually really matches the color of this rock high up in Qinghai as well. So again, amazing species, really well adapted uh, for, for their different environments. But there are still threats. Uh, even though guns are illegal in China, private ownership is illegal, there's still poachers. Uh, this is a photo uh, from infrared camera, uh, camera trap used for wildlife that actually caught a poacher on camera. And he, you can see here, he's wearing the fur of, of, of one of his, um, you know, his, his, his catches. And the gun, I think the gun is a fascinating gun. I mean, it's almost like a gun you would see from a hundred years ago. Uh, but that's what you have, have when you actually have these homemade guns and these villagers making their own bullets. And they actually, this is a picture of a gun that some rangers found on a patrol. And uh, the hunters are hiding the guns under rocks in the mountains. So they don't have them in their homes. They don't have liability in case they're checked. 
and then they'll go up to the mountain, retrieve their gun, and begin hunting. And this is just the report of a local conservationist. And again, it looks like a gun from you know, the Civil War or something in the United States. It's really, really fascinating. But uh, so it's not very accurate, uh, but you know, it, it does kill. So also in this picture here, uh, going back one slide, you see in his hand, there are some wire traps here and he's holding his hand. These wire traps are one of the most common methods of hunting the animals in China. Uh, you can buy them today in China on Taobao, the largest uh, online platform for about 10 RMB, so about you know a, a dollar and a half, and uh, you can just buy them. So and and a lot of the work of these rangers are actually taking down these wire traps from the mountains. And the man who found this uh, gun is is this man uh, Yu Jiafa. Uh, this year he's 70 years old, and he actually started Sichuan's earliest grassroots conservation group, and he's here holding a bullet casing that we found up here in the mountains. Actually, during the Wenchuan earthquake. Uh, Yu Jiahua was in the mountains when it happened, uh, right around Wenchuan, um, stopping poachers from poaching. And he actually experienced the earthquake on the mountaintop ridges. And uh, he still does his work in terrain like this, around 4,000 meters, and also with bags on their back like this. So it's just really, really hard work, very steep. You don't want to fall, and you have to keep on going. Uh, but there's more than, than, than just Sichuan out there. So this is uh, near, near Beijing, actually, and not many people think of Beijing as a hiking paradise, but indeed it's right next to the Taihang mountain range. And uh, this is the highest peak in Beijing. Uh, we're hiking here, and this is actually uh, participating in a survey to look for North Chinese leopards. So there, are, there were North Chinese leopards inside of Beijing in the early 2000s. Now, they haven't been seen since, but they're in the neighboring province of Hebei. These are some citizen science volunteers um, surveying the landscape and the habitat for potential uh, ecological corridors for the leopard to return to Beijing. So again, leopards in Beijing, you don't often think of that, but if you don't know about that, uh, then, then, then you can't support their return and the conservation efforts. And again, this is also the Taihang Mountains, very, very rocky, very, very hard. Uh, I have found that in most cases, people in China doing conservation uh, are always willing to put their lives or at least their comfort on the line to achieve their goals. Moving back south and to Yunnan, this is a forest ranger named uh, Tai Zhihong. He's 50 years old. He's been doing this work for almost 30 years in the Gaoligongshan. Uh, and the Gaoligongshan is China's, uh, again, one of the most biodiverse pockets of all of China, one of the most credible areas. And uh, Tai Zhihong has been here uh, protecting the Skywalker Gibbon. The Skywalker Gibbon was only discovered as a new species three years ago in 2017, and there are less than 150 individuals left inside of China. Uh, they were traditionally hunted for Chinese medicine, for the belief that actually eating gibbon brain can uh, cure diseases like epilepsy. Uh, and now there, and also there's a lot of um, deforestation in China in the in the 70s as well, which destroyed a lot of their their ideal habitat. So. Hydro Hong has been one of the uh, few rangers left protecting them. And this is, this is the Skywalker Gibbon, uh, an incredible, incredible species. I'll uh, let you hear its song. It has a wonderful song that it sings about every morning uh, when it wakes up. I'll, I'll give you a snippet of that. Is it frozen? Oh, uh, could you could you, uh, were you able to hear the song? Not. No. Oh no, no. No. Okay. Um. Well, for time's sake, I think, I think we'll just keep on going. Sorry about that. Um. But this is so. Then again, moving on towards uh, the rivers, the rivers of China. This is uh, protecting the Chinese uh, river sturgeon in, in the Yangtze River, here in Sichuan. Um, again, this is an endangered fish species, and the only way they're able to keep up their wild populations is by breeding them in captivity and then releasing them. Uh, but there's a problem because actually these fish can be, uh, as long as they're bred domestically or, or in farms, they can could, they could be consumed uh, in restaurants. And so it's very hard for people to tell though where they get their fish. Is it from a legal fish farm or is it from the Yangtze River? Uh, and this is a, a band of, there's about a hundred different uh, local volunteers here that uh, have a volunteer patrol group along the Yangtze River. 
This is inside China's new Shenongjia National Park, uh, where the rangers are quite new. They have just been hired uh, to be rangers in the national park. They have a salary of about uh, less than 2,000 renminbi a month uh, for their work. So maybe around 300 US dollars a month to do their work. And uh, traditionally involves a lot of hard climbing. Um, maybe they will go on a patrol about once a, uh, one week every month. Uh, to, again, to stop poaching, to survey uh, the camera traps that they put there for the photos of the wildlife, and to make sure that uh, there's no poaching. And out into Anni uh, Machin on the, on the Qinghai Plateau, these are local Tibetans doing a glacial study, um, stopping or, or documenting climate change. They can't stop it. That, that's on us in the big cities and the big countries, but uh, out here in the Tibetan Plateau where they have a low carbon footprint, uh, these are the people who are telling the story of conservation and, and documenting the glacial change. And uh, this is lastly, one of my favorite places in Nyepayutsi, uh, uh, again, one of the beautiful places in Qinghai province, incredible lakes, um, incredible flowers. And so in the interest of time here, um, I'll just quickly go through these last couple of slides, but uh, there's one here in Qinghai in the National Park, which can only be found at about hundred kilometers squared. There's also Tibetan, um, Buddhist monks, uh, monks who are who are doing conservation in, in their traditional ways. They believe that as part of Tibetan Buddhism, they have a responsibility to protect wildlife and to share it with others. So this monk is actually climbing a cliff to take a photo of a of a um, a class one protected uh, bird species in China, an eagle roosting on the rock. And again, up in the glaciers, this is a local Tibetan. Um, we're climbing a glacier here again to document climate change. You can see the glaciers turn black from the melt and the accumulated um, rock and debris from the melt, which turns the glacier black, which makes the glacier melt even faster. And that year, we found these uh, dead bird carcasses all across the glacier, about uh, 30 of them. Um, and they didn't know why they were. In fact, this is the first time they had ever witnessed this, but they also, the, this was probably the hottest summer on their record. Um, and so one of the monks theorized that uh, the birds had been nesting in the glacier when the glacier had collapsed. And this would have been many years ago, but um, and it would have crushed the birds there. And then you can see all the dirt on the glacier turning the glacier black, which makes the glacier melt even faster. And so here you are, 2016, 2017, 2018. Um, they're painting the glacier's grave, as you will, um, on the rocks of where it was and where it's retreating. So climate change is affecting all of China. It's one of the biggest uh, problems and challenges the whole world faces. Uh, but one of the best safeguards against climate change and the problems is protecting biodiversity. And biodiversity allows for species to recover quicker. And ending right here, again, China, number three in the world. This is compiled by Manga Bay, a great environmental news site for anyone who's interested. But China's number three in the world for biodiversity. And, and uh, so the United States, I think, is around number seven. So again, China is incredibly biodiverse. There are tons of things going on, and it's worth protecting. And I'm sure. Conway has uh, even more experience than me upon protecting China's biodiversity, and I'll, I'll hand it over to him. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, these images just makes me completely homesick. And I just want to, I saw in the audience, uh, Mr. Ed Norton, who was the very, very first person to work on the Nature Conservancy's efforts in Chinese National Park project um, is on the line with us as well. So I just want to give him a shout out and um, thank you for laying the ground. Um, Conway, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you. It's uh, such a great pleasure to uh, be in a guest on the Wild China virtual uh, events. And uh, also it's an honor, uh, Mr. Edward Norton. And we heard about your story for almost like 20 years and your first uh, dream to have a national park alongside the uh, Three River Para in the Yunnan now almost become true because the government is going to plan to do that in the uh, next five years, but uh, we are not sure about that. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, okay, I think... I think it's coming, May. It's coming, right? 
Yes, it, it is there. Okay. Um, so I'm going to tell you more story about how the people and uh, grown up in Western China, almost like a desert, become a conservationist. And uh, for the most people in the Western world, would think uh, most of the conservationist uh, is grown up in the Western world, not in China. But uh, we actually have a lot of people working on this. And Kai already showed you some photos that uh, there's really grassroots level people who are villagers, and they work on that as the rangers and uh, to conserve the most important biodiversity in our country. And uh, I will not show too much data um, and uh, science uh, because in Nature Conservancy, we uh, take us as the science based and um, uh, site based uh, hardcore conservation organization worldwide. We work in uh, 18 countries. Um, and we started to work in China, invited by the Chinese government 20 years ago. Um, so in terms of the uh, data, just to show from Kyle, we are the th number three country who gets the biodiversity in the world. But um, 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 according to our last chance special planning of the Nature Conservancy, actually we take 9.5 of the world most important biodiversity in the world. So it's one tenth of the world. <clears throat> and this is uh, my favorite pictures. And uh, you can see the right one. This is the smallest falcon. It's called a fa uh, collared falconate. It's like a sparrow. And we I took this picture uh, um, uh, very close to the Burma, the border between the Burma and the China. And uh, myself is a birding fan also. So this is the place I, where I was, I was born. It, uh, it's in the Lois uh, Plateau. It's quite like the black line uh, Kyle just showed. So the right one here, if you can see my, my, my mouse, this is just for really rich people. This picture from a Shanxi province. They, this um, uh, house must have built in like in a hundred years ago. It's like a very big family who have very good, good business. So this uh, cave house, you can see that. It's alongside the, um, the, 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 the small hills and then they dig a big hole. And this is uh, in the Shanxi, northern of Shanbei province. You can see it's actually decorated. And if you live inside of this cave house, it's actually very good. It's, um, it's cool, it's cool in the summertime. Outside is very hot, but it's warm inside in winter time because uh, it's very thick. So today the people use it like in a storage. You can actually storage your crops here inside and for many years actually, because the temperature is, uh, is, very, um, is, is very good and suitable for that. And this one, the right bigger one is very much similar to where I was, I was born. I tried to find the old picture from um, my family album, but I can't find any of them. So this is quite similar. And I was born in uh, one of these cave house. So I can talk to you today because the you know, one thing happened uh, is uh, instinctive of my mom. So one of the soil clay is dropped down from the top of the cave house uh, before my mom decided that uh, in 10 minutes that she should uh, remove me, move me from her left side to the right side. So then after 10 minutes, the soil rock, the soil uh, block just dropped onto my pillow. Uh, that was uh, around uh, more than 20 kilo big. It's, it's a very big rock actually. And so my mom saved me and uh, today I try to save the nature in this country, but I'm not sure what I'm doing. Uh, can really do the, uh, make the difference. Okay, the next one. See here, actually, you can see the landscape and also the vegetation where in my hometown. Here's the Gobi Desert, you can see that. And the, here's uh, the, the, this pin is uh, where I was, was born. So our um, uh, childhood spent uh, many times for, to herd our sheep and uh, goat in this region. And here's the Yellow River. You can see alongside the Yellow River because of the irrigation. The, the, the vegetation is quite different. That's why it's green. But all alongside this area, the population is very less. And the, totally in the place where I was born, it's a province. The population is less than 6 million. So for most of the people who in the US will think, wow, that's, that's a, such a small population in this province. Yes, that's true. Very small because uh, basically, actually people can't live here. We even don't have the drinking water. So this is me. Um, I have a binoculars print in my T-shirt. You can see that. I believe it's a Swarovski brand. It's very interesting. <clears throat> and uh, 
after I actually uh, get my university degree in Chengdu, I was uh, recruited by one of the most uh, uh, known company, named the Bear Company from Germany, as a salesman for the pet vaccine in, uh, in uh, Guangdong province. So I think it's a very good job. And uh, the salary offered from Bear Company is like four times of my professor and my father, actually. But I don't think it's really a cool job. I don't know why. So one of my professor, he's a uh, uh, top scientist of IGA. IGA is uh, short for the International Goat Association. It's sponsored by Hefe International in China. And Hefe International is also an uh, international organization working on anti-poverty. Um, um, so my professor have a very good connection with the Hefe International. So he said that you, maybe you can try the Hefe International work with that stuff. And then in that year of July of year, uh, 2001, I become a full-time staff of Hafer International. And uh, in the year 2005, we have a, a very interesting program. It's joined with the uh, Mountain Institute, also the headquarter, I believe, in the US. So the basic rationale, the idea is um, the Hafer International, which is the, um, um, the capacity of um, us. So myself actually established our office in the Tibet. So the joint program is try to improve the yak management capacity. And in the meantime, those farmers, Tibetan farmers, they can take care of the hatching habitats of the black necked cream. But uh, when we, I get there, I found that actually the local people, they live in harmony with the black necked cream for thousands of years. And the year 2001, the total population of black necked crane is a 16, 1600. And up to now, after 20 years of the conservation, the totally we have a black necked crane, what widely around uh, 14,000. It's actually 10 times large. And uh, basically it's because of uh, the government first work with this, uh, um, the farmers on the plateau. And second, uh, we established uh, a lot wetland, especially these high plateau wetland reserves, according to the data and also Kyle's data I already showed you, within these 40 years, we have done a lot of job to establish the, this nature reserves to save this species. And alongside that, I think it's not enough, but I've still worked for the Hafer International. I found another amazing creature. This is called a Przewalski gazelle. It's not very familiar to the Western world, but uh, on historically, we totally have 600,000 of the population um, on the Tibetan plateau, on the most um, des desertification area or the Gobi Desert in Western China. But uh, on the day of uh, my uh, first population survey of uh, this species, its uh, total population dropped down to 800. So our final results, outputs of this uh, species population survey is 807, um, uh, 37 is that uh, precisely we counted. It's all in live in the Qinghai Lake, where is the biggest salt uh, um, inland uh, lake in China. So you can see actually what's happened is uh, because of the, it's, uh, the, 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 the genetic exchange is barred by this fencing. And the fancy come to our nomads in the uh, Tibetan area and also the northern China nomadic area like uh, 20 years ago. So actually this adult gazelle, they can jump through the fence, but this uh, youngster, um, they actually cannot. I have seen many of this, they, 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 the belly was a scorch and then there was a dead because of the fencing. So what I'm doing, I convinced my project beneficiaries of a Hafer project to remove off the fence to connect all these uh, three small population. And then now up to today, we totally have around uh, 1600 of a Przewalski uh, gazelle alongside the Qinghai Lake. So I think that still, you know, we can make a difference even within the 10 years for this population. And then Chengdu, most of the people know this place because uh, of uh, this amazing creature. Uh, panda, and uh, but mostly you have seen the panda is in the panda base in China like this. It's very cute and lazy, but actually in the in wild place it's not. It's like this. They are a tough animal, 
that's why they can live uh, after the ice age, the fourth ice age, and uh, they even change the behavior for the foraging. Uh, they eat bamboo, right? So the basically what TNC did after this project, this is the first time myself invited by Nature Conservancy, because I just totally changed my idea why I work with anti-poverty and the sense that people actually they can um, live in harmony with the uh, the 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 uh, the, the, uh, the the sacred species. So. Um, we introduced the first land trust conservation, but for sure we actually introduced a national park concept uh, 20 years ago already in the Yunnan province. And you see from this picture, just left side, the idea is, uh, is, is very simple. So this is uh, the TNC defined as the uh, prioritized conservation areas in China. And all this uh, blue an area, blue, blue uh, no, no, green blocks, is actually the panda habitats. So we try to find the gap of this conservation habitats. Now, most of that, it was uh, already established in the nature reserves to conserve these uh, rare species. But uh, in the, some of them, it's not. Like, like especially like in, in this county, it's called Pinwu County. So Pinwu County totally, we have uh, almost like a 400 of the panda species, which is the one fifth of the total wild panda species in the world. So there's already four nature reserves. And then we find one of the former timber farm to work with and establish the first land trust, land trust conservation model, which means actually we try to promote the social philanthropy donation in our country to take the capacity building, to take the fundraising and also meantime the conservation technology. And then it becomes one of the famous um, conservation model. And so myself, we work as uh, the, the, the team's staff and in the meantime, we promote the land trust conservation model um, in uh, other provinces of China, like Yunnan province, the Trump province, even in the Eastern of China. Now we have a land trust alliance and uh, nature conservancy. We work as the one of the key uh, core um, member of this alliance. And in this um, nature reserve, we established, we actually found a uh, very interesting um, thing, because most people would think the, peep, the panda, they eat bamboo, but in one night, which is almost like a 10 years ago, we taken a lot of the pictures. It's the first time we found out that the panda, they eat in the talking dead body leg. And I, so um, it's, um, it takes almost like six hours um, from the now the, another day is uh, 11 o'clock p.m. Then done. Then to the next day is 5 o'clock in the a.m. And uh, so I combine this uh, uh, 600 pictures, and it becomes a very ama amazing video. You can see that. I will show you. Uh, okay. Can't wait. I'm afraid we are running very, very tight on time. Uh, maybe shortly after, yeah. we can, can 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 we wrap up in the mi next minute? Okay. Sure. Thank you. Okay. I think it's coming. <laughs> there we go. Here, you actually can easily, you can see it's attacking a rear leg. And, um, you know, e each of the time when the infrared cameras uh, take the picture in nighttime, it has to flash. So it flashes for more than like around 700, 700 times. But uh, even in this condition, the panda is still there to take uh, his talking. So this uh, makes, you know, the, 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 the institutes and also the academic and the scientists in China, the first time you see such an amazing video. Um, <clears throat> okay, so then, um, so then we try to, uh, uh, it's like the promote this model then done to the, uh, the Yunnan province. And the amazing place we found out is that uh, the one of the components of the key uh, research program is um, the migrant birds so that tracking uh, how they, mig how they um, migrate from the, uh, the high line plateau to the uh, northern part of China. So basically we have this uh, four different species, the reddish duck, a gray goose, uh, common cormorant, and also the bar-headed um, 
uh, goods. So the most amazing one actually we got is this uh, common cormorant. And I'm going to also show you another very um, short video to show how we make this um, very short video. Okay, wait a minute, it's coming. I can see that. You know, basically because of the, uh, um, the common current, uh, they are uh, cormorant, they, because of the, they, they have to swallow a fish entirely. So very few scientists um, will do the tracking them because uh, it's kind of like dangerous. But this is uh, like in the coin, um, you know, we, it's very hard to catch this kind of a bird. So we try to find out how they use the habitats alongside uh, the Yunnan province and also on the, on the, on the plateau. And this is uh, my top ranger. He's a fantastic bird. Huh? So, okay, you can see the tracker is here. Yeah, he's, you see, he's a tracker. <laughs> okay, it's gone. So you still, you can see the tracker. Okay, I close here. And then I'm going to show you, actually it's a, it's a, it's a stay alongside the Qinghai Lake, then it's a fly back. So when it's a fly back, actually this GPS tracker, I was, uh, I claim it back. And uh, I think this is the first time we actually, you know, get the best data. And in the meantime, we can have this GPS uh, back, um, tracker back. <clears throat> Thank you. And also, I want to show you another picture. It's an amazing thing is that, uh, you know, Kyle and myself, we both live in Chengdu. And, uh, you know, Chengdu is one of another icon is, uh, it's uh, the sound, the sacred bird, golden foil from the Jinsha ruin. So this is uh, right now is also the China cultural heritage. And this is on the around the 12 centimeter, it's a golden foil. It's from uh, uh, ancient, um, uh, ruin, which is uh, 3,000 to 4,000 uh, before the Christ. So people would think about what is it, basically. And uh, alongside the history, we actually found out that one of the king's name, his name is uh, um, Fish Eagle. So his name is Fish Eagle, and uh, he must be the people who first seen how the common common to, to catch the fish, and then he collected the the eggs of the common cormorant and then teach people how to use the common cormorant to, to, to get the fish as the food for the people. So today, even today, you can see this skills in the archive of, uh, of uh, Dali of Yunnan province and also in the region of China, if you've got the opportunity to see them. And I also found some literature for our scientists to find out this. I, I, I'm afraid we, are, we probably have quite a lot of questions piled up. It's wonderful to see this last picture. Uh, tell us what this picture about is about, and then we'll move on. Is that all right? Okay, this is my, my last picture. This is Chengdu. So I just uh, tell you the icon of first for Chengdu is the panda. And the second one, the sun and the sacred bird. And now you understand actually the sacred bird have some connection with me, which is a common cormorant, as we know. And another thing is that Chengdu is a great city because of uh, it's the only city who have uh, more than 10 million people who live under the uh, snow-capped mountain, which is higher than uh, 7,000 meters. You act, this is a picture easily take from uh, the city of Chengdu when we have the cl very clear sunny day. Um, so I guess this is, uh, you know, must be like the best reason I, and also on the Kai, we choose to believe in this amazing city and right. welcome you to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Conway. You know, in fact, this image of Chengdu, I published it on my uh, Facebook and many old China hands who lived in China before said, no, that's photoshopped. This is not the Chengdu we know. <laughs> Um, but China is changing. Thank you both for this incredible presentation and showing us what it's like on the ground in China. And there are tons of questions here and we'll try to get to some of them. I think the very first one is, uh, is a combination of my own question as well, actually. 
conservation work in China, particularly national park, is very, very different from the US, right? And Kyle, in particular, the stories that you told about the park rangers are uh, incredible. And we want to know more. In particular, there's a question that with the new park system and managed overlaps and increase of ecotourism, do these changes affect these rangers uh, specifically? Um, for the better or for worse, do they have, what what are what are their immediate concerns? Maybe that's something we can all help. Yeah, I think that that's a great question. Uh, the national park system and ecotourism, for the rangers in their perspective, is a good thing. Uh, China's had a major push to eliminate poverty by the end of 2020 as well, and it coincides with the national park initiative. And so I think that China really wants the two initiatives to link and join hands. And a lot of these rangers actually came uh, in the, when they were young, they were doing uh, construction work in other provinces, uh, which actually paid more than being a ranger. Uh, but a lot of them have come back to their homes either because they miss their homes, their parents are getting old, or they want to settle down and have a family. And then they're looking for work. And a lot of times the only available work is through groups maybe like TNC or other NGOs that help link them up with the government and then they become rangers and they're making less though than they did. And so, but a lot of this with China is, China's really pushing to build its ecotourism industry and build uh, nature education programs and nature tour tourism programs. And a lot of times the rangers that I have met uh, kind of do double duty as uh, a ranger, maybe one week a month. And then uh, they also try to promote their own nature education programs. For example, in Pingmu, where Conway talked about, uh, you can drive about five hours from Chengdu and stay with the rangers, experience their traditional home life, and they'll like take you camping for a weekend and, and they have uh, education programs for children, et cetera. So I think for the rangers aspect, they're very excited about ecotourism. Whether or not China can handle the number of ecotourists out of a country of 1.4 billion people who are desperate to go see nature, that's a whole nother question. Conway, tell us how you guys involved, the Nature Conservancy's project involved the local communities and turn them into rangers or participants in the uh, uh, in conservation effort. The TNC, um, Nature Conservancy engaged in the national park actually have a long, very long history in this country. And 20 years ago, we introduced the first uh, national park actually concept to be in this country. And um, we think um, at that time, 20 years ago, I know that Edward Norton, Mr. and also the, you, you, and the following staff engaged it a lot because that, at that time, it was basically the idea how the national park can balance in the tourism and also the meantime, the conservation. So the basic idea is to sacrifice 5% of the conservation areas and then to conserve the 90%, 95% of the, um, the, the habitats. This is actually the basic idea. And then for the TNC as a non-government uh, NGO, international NGO, what we are doing actually, we found out the, the best practice, uh, what widely, what, what, whatever you take the case in uh, Europe or in, um, in North America and also in Australia, New Zealand uh, or East Africa, the social engagement when we talking about the um, the, the 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 tourism in the in national park, actually quite right now all the official documents of the national park in China officially we call it like a visitors. It's not a tourists, right? So the the natural experience is takes more important than any as the past the sport uh, scenic sports like a Jiujiegu or your Huangshan, like this famous place, but. Uh, the, the 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 social engagement, you know, it's a still as 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 we. Yeah, I think I think there's uh, some signal issues there. We'll we'll move on. Actually, the, he touched and Conway touched on one of the very important questions that I've observed. And Kyle, you and I touched on this. I would love to hear more. Is the Chinese uh, national park system seems to be a government thing. That's like sort of separate from private citizens, right? It's funded by the government. And actually citizens or tourists are cardened off. Like Conway was saying, the 5% is given to the tourist. And so most uh, local population or visitors don't really have the opportunity to engage with nature the way you engaged uh, or your rangers engaged. And it seems like conservation is keeping people out. 
while US is conservation is bringing people in. Do you see a possibility of a change or whether a change is needed? And do you see one specific question is are these long trails like John Muir Trail happening in China, uh, connecting the national parks or within the national parks? That's, that, that's a great question. I think the most important thing first is understanding context. The US has about a fourth of the population of China. So you are dealing with that. And then secondly, yes, China's national parks, they have core zones. The most pristine, ecologically valuable parts of these parks are off limits to tourists. And it's really the outside parts that are, that are available. And I do not see or think that in the next five years at least, we will have a national park system as we think about in the US with backcountry permits or trails. And I do not see any efforts to make that happen. Uh, I think that is partly because the hiking and backpacking culture, while it is actually growing very, very quickly, yeah. it's not at the attention of local government officials. And so you see still very a very structured, um, where it's, it may be a nature tour or a photography tour, or a bird watching tour, uh, but it's going to be on the fringes and having a backcountry experience is not something that is being facilitated. Now you do see though, um, people kind of taking the um, flag of trail building on them by themselves. In 2000, I know Conway knows a bit more about this too, but in 2016, a group uh, completed a trail, a through trail through the entire Hongguan range, 2000 kilometers from Yunnan all the way through Sichuan to the southern tip of Gansu through you know, all the pictures that we saw in the mountains, it goes right through it. Um, and they wanna make this a national trail, but again, without government support or without uh, you know, a large popular following, is it a trail if you just have a GPS track and no one walking it? You know, it, it, it's hard to say. So I think we see an underground, like growing outdoors industry movement to make trails and have deeper backcountry experiences but from the government top-down level and for the most tourists in China, you do not see that on their priority list. Oh my God. I mean, that trail just sounds absolutely amazing. I think that will be one of the projects that TNC can take up. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, one question here, Chuck Lennox um, specifically asked, I think Kyle talked about this earlier, is he said, I understand that China is beginning to develop an official national park system. How does that differ from all the forest parks and uh, construction zones or tourist parks? Tell us how the national park yeah. works differently from the yeah. other parks. Great question. So from what I can see, it really depends on the national parks. There are 10 pilot parks that were announced in 2015. They're due to be complete by 2020. The entire national park system is due to complete uh, by 2035. So we are gonna see a lot more than 10. But in this 10 right now, we have a, we have a massive diversity. For example, in the uh, Wuyi Shan National Park, Wuyi Shan National Park was already a, a very uh, tourist popular destination. Um, and now it's really just being administratively upgraded the national park, which means that it's getting more funding and resources from the national government. But you also see places like the Giant Panda National Park, which is a conglomeration of, I think, over 50 separate protected areas. So in the past, these protected areas were functioning um, differently. They had separate, you know, uh, administrative uh, procedures. And now basically uh, the National Park Administration uh, from the central government can govern uh, the entire national park. Uh, but I think as, as Conway pointed out to me, uh, just, uh, I think yesterday when we were talking, I think it only covers about 70% of the giant pandas national habitat. So while it is an ecological corridor, it doesn't cover it all. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, th this actually, that's a question directed at both of you. Um, how, how, do get how do people get started participating or working in the Nature Conservancy you know, either with the government or with uh, nonprofit organizations? How do they begin their career? Uh, and second question related to that is the wages are so low, um, why would people choose to do so? <laughs> or how do we encourage more to do so? I think, I think there's, uh, there's actually many options. It depends on what kind of work you really want to do. You want to, do the, to be a practitioner, you want to be a researcher, or you just want to work as a volunteer. 
And I think uh, in a different option, you got uh, different ideas. And uh, I think it's very open to all. And the best thing is that, right? The Nature and Conservancy and some of the um, uh, national park management bureaus, they start to establish the volunteer management uh, mechanisms. And TNC is one of the organization. We actually established this regulation and uh, operation handbook for the Giant Panda National Park and also meantime for the Bai Shanzu National Park in the Zhejiang province. I think. Um, uh, yeah, we all will get opportunity. And uh, I also want to be a volunteer for the main national parks in our country. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. And uh, the uh, audience here specifically asked, Tang Jiahe, the video you shot, um, the pandas were eating a leg of Taken, right? Yeah. And where was that shot specifically? Someone was back from there. It was uh, nearby the Tangjiahe. So Tangjiahe is a neighbor of Old Creek Nature Reserve. And this Old Creek in Chinese we call La Hugo Nature Reserve is established the Paradise Foundation and the TNC together as the first land trust conservation model in our country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, and let me see, there are a few other questions. Uh, Kyle, uh, that there's a question I think many people want to travel with you already next year, 2021, with Wild China. What are you cooking up? Which itinerary? Oh, there, there is too many places to go. It's a little overwhelming, but a little hint may involve uh, the Sanjiang National Park in Qinghai and possible snow leopards. So, uh, and also some really interesting Tibetan conservationists. Um, so that, that's a little hint. But there are, I mean, there, there are too many places to go. It's, it's absolutely overwhelming. Okay, I hate and people. Uh, and people maybe don't know how big the Sanjiang National Park is. It's almost like 13 times of Yellowstone. 13 times of Yellowstone. Amazing. Yeah. Yes. The next question I have for both, both of you, it's a ridiculous question to answer, but I'll ask it. Um, your favorite national park in China? Kangwei, you want to... Uh... <laughs> I, 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 think, I think for me it's uh, Sanjiang Yuan National Park because uh, this is the only place where you actually can conduct a similar safari like Eastern Africa. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I believe after the 50 years, we can have the similar uh, species population there in the Sanjiang Yuan National Park. And uh, we still need a lot of work on uh, species restoration and wetland restoration and also the visitors management, which is very important. Mm -hmm. Uh, for me, it would be the Chilean Mountains National Park, which is uh, right north of Sanjiang Yuan on the border of uh, Gansu and, and Qinghai. And I, it's actually one of the places I've been the least, but I'm dying to go back more. I mean, it is, the landscape is so diverse, just from glaciers to, you know, pine forests that seems like in the Pacific Northwest. And then the northern part of it, you have this, you know, desert, crazy Utah-like landscape. I think uh, the Chilean Mountains is probably one of the most diverse wild, underappreciated, I would say the next like hiking gem of China, I think, take note. And uh, that, that place is absolutely amazing. Okay, uh, three places. If you get a chance to put in the chat room, Kyle, one is the name of the first photo in China where you took, that looks like Antelope Park. Where is that? Wow. Yeah, okay. And is where to go uh, near Beijing to look for the wildlife that you talked about, leopards near Beijing. And three is where would you go in Xilian Shan? Okay. Okay. Any chance that, that would be that will be wonderful. Um, I think we are almost out of time. Uh, do you guys have any last words to say? What for us as audience, as individuals, what can we do to to participate or contribute a little bit to conservation? I, I think uh, just shortly. I think well, Tommy, it's very interesting when you said you posted the photo of uh, of Conway's uh, Chengdu photo, and a lot of people didn't believe that that it was Chengdu. And I think just going back to that idea that people don't see China as wild, they don't see China, they see it as a lost cause, honestly, uh, you know, too many times. And if you see it that way. You're never going to know what is out there worth protecting, and you're never going to share the joy of protecting these places. So I think if you're not in China, I think paying attention to what TNC, the other groups are doing, and also paying attention to what is happening and, you know, and sharing more than just, you know, photos of Beijing in 2012. I think 
I think, and if you're in China, then yes, I think it's on you to go contact TNC. You can be a volunteer. You can uh, you know, do a summer of research if you're a student. I think there's always ways to get involved, uh, whether it's just sharing on social media, these real images, or if you're in China and getting actively involved with donating your time, talent, or money. Yes. Can't wait. I think it come and enjoy because uh, most of the people would think that China is very much like a uh, Han Chinese culture dominated. Actually, when you experience our Western part, the diversity is not just a uh, life species, wildlife species, it's also the culture. So you probably easily, you can, uh, you know, across one country, they speak in Tibetan language, another, they speak a Mongolia language, and the, another one, they even speak Turkish. So um, it's going to be amazing. And uh, I think for me, like 20 years work on this, um, um, mostly spend my time in Western China and um, I never feel like uh, bored and uh, boring on this. And uh, I find uh, the new things every day and also I find myself every day. Yeah, uh, I, I, you couldn't have said it better, both of you, Kyle and Conway, thank you so much. Really, I think what we can do is by traveling to these places. I want to quote, quote Freeman Tilden. He said, through interpretation, there is understanding and through understanding, appreciation and through appreciation, protection. And I hope, you know, our travels will allow us to appreciate the beauty of it and engage us more in the future to protect these beautiful places, wilder places of China, right? So thank you. We're almost out of time. I just want to say uh, a few words. Um, as Kyle mentioned earlier, he's working with the Wild China team to bring out some journeys, allow everybody to enjoy, not everybody, small group, only 12 people to enjoy um, these, some of these national parks in 2021. So do sign up for our newsletter or our WeChat um, to, to get updated on that. Two more events coming up. Uh, next one is a Taste of China lab, uh, collaboration with China Institute. It will be on tea, Fujian Wulong tea. And also another event before Christmas is our book club. This month we read China's new youth and chatting with the author, Alec Ash, who lives in Dali. So thank you all our experts joining us from China. We're very happy that you could bring China to everybody's living room this evening. Thank you. And thank you for joining. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.